Hey, welcome to The Conversation. This is Andy Mason, and you're listening to Authentic Conversations Around the Messy Intersection of Faith, Family, and Business. Hey, this session, we have entitled it, How to Foolproof Your Life. I have been having some conversations with people, and this is so pertinent to now. I'm not talking about avoiding mistakes, because Although that might seem like it foolproofs your life, actually you reduce your life to nothing. As in, this is not about avoiding making mistakes. That's just part of curiosity and learning. And if you really wanted to avoid making mistakes, then don't get married, don't play sports, don't start a business, pretty much don't do anything. That's just part of life. We make failures. It's normal to make mistakes. What I'm talking about is, How do you make sure that you're not living in that mistake a year later or two years later and wake up and find yourself being feeding stupid for the last 12 months? That's really, really painful. Well, there is one guaranteed way to prevent that, to foolproof your life. And it's this one word. It's called humility. It's the pathway forward is humility. Humility is about inviting others in. And so what I've actually got is a message from Chris Valentin, who I work with, work closely with, and who has been literally walking this out for the last 12 months. And so I've seen it firsthand how he's navigating that. But actually, uh, nine months ago, he did this message on the 15 attributes of humility. Well, actually, the message was a lot longer than that. But this is literally the 15 minutes capturing the 15 attributes of humility. So I'm going to play that. And as you listen to this, just be aware of where's the conviction for you. Is there one of these that you need to actually lean into in order to foolproof your life, in order to ensure that you don't get five, ten years down the track and then realize, oh my gosh, I've made such a mess. It's so hard to dig out of something. We've just been talking with a friend who's a marriage and family therapist. It's really, really fascinating to walk with people when you become realize or you realize you've done something wrong that's one level oh my gosh i've made a mistake i'm so sorry here let's clean it up that's easy at the surface level but so many people where you've been feeding a particular lifestyle or belief for years perhaps four years then it's not just about a quick change now it's about unraveling four years of beliefs and investment it's become your treasure or identity that's what's really painful this little word humility and how we practice it and live it out will keep you from that it's so helpful so valuable so enjoy this and uh, we will see you again next week I want to share quickly some attributes of humility 15 attributes of humility number one you actually do pray <laughs> It's funny, you know, people will fight to have prayer in school, but then once they get it, they don't pray. Sometimes we fight for prayer in school and don't even pray at home. The ultimate, ultimate arrogance, prayerlessness is the ultimate arrogance. Number two, you are influenceable. Like, how do you know if you're humble? People can actually influence you. You, you actually, other people's opinion actually matters to you, not in a fear of man way, but you're, you don't think, well, if it hasn't happened to me, if I don't know it, then it can't be true. You actually are influenceable. Number three, you can be corrected without defending yourself. You can be corrected without defending yourself. I don't know about you, but I don't like being wrong. I don't think anyone likes being wrong. But God has put people in our lives that can see our blind spots. And they are gifts from God. We are gifts from God to one another. And when someone comes into our life and sees something in our life that doesn't feel healthy, it's a gift that they have the courage and that you have given them a place to actually speak into your life. And to defend yourself without a heart that listens, that humbles itself and says, is it possible they could be right? I can be corrected without defending myself. Number four, you rejoice when others are celebrated. You rejoice when others are celebrated. I don't know about you, but I can rejoice easily when someone's celebrated for something I don't really care about. Like baseball, I don't really like baseball. It's like, hey, he became a famous baseball player. Like, yay. 
I don't play baseball. I don't even know who the famous players are. It's easy to celebrate someone in something that you don't want. But how about celebrating people who get what you want? How hard is it to celebrate people who get what you'd like to have? Humility celebrates people and realizes that their opportunity doesn't take away from my opportunity. Just because you became, it may be my world, you became a, a, a New York best-selling author doesn't mean I can't become one. Your God promoting you doesn't mean that he took it from me. There's something about humility that understands that we can celebrate others' victories. Number five, there's no job too small for you. <laughs> this is, I learned this one really good. There's no job too small for you. I, you know, we travel the world. We, we aren't traveling right now. <laughs> Very much. It's just a change. You know, yesterday I was chained in my wood shop, which was actually pretty good. Like, send me to my room and I will make something. <laughs> but sometimes we come home, you know, we fly to Russia, South Africa. By the way, I miss the Russians this year. I'm supposed to be in Russia right now. God bless you, Russians. South Africa, Lafayette, Asia, Europe, all these countries, and we come home, and, and, and when we're on the road, we're like, we're like the heroes. We're like, oh, we love your word. Oh, that, you prayed for me, and I got healed. Oh, and then we come home, and we get it, and we come home from a long trip, and we walk in the house, and, 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 and my wife's like, Kathy's like, can you take out the garbage? Like, do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> do you know who you're talking to? I'm healing the sick. I'm prophesying to nations. Kings are coming to me. She's like, that's all good. Take out the garbage. How many of you know humility means there's no job too small for you? Humility means there's no job too small for you. Number six, you don't always have to be right. You don't always have to be right. Humility means you don't always have to be right. Number seven, you naturally seek advice from other people. I think that's self-explanatory, but when you're humble, you know what pride does? Pride sometimes doesn't seek advice because pride says, well, I'm as smart as anyone in the room. Certainly if there was an answer, I would have it. And pride says, I'm not gonna go seek a counselor. I'm not gonna go get, I'm not gonna go ask somebody else what I should do because I'm the smartest person in the room. But humility goes, God gives wisdom to other people and an abundance of counselors, there's victory. Number seven, no, number eight, you are teachable. I think we talked about this in, in, the, in the influence way, but you are teachable. You know, once we stop learning, we start dying. Once we stop learning, we start dying. Number nine, we freely admit our flaws, our mistakes, and our failures. We freely admit our flaws, mistakes, and failures. You know, uh, we've been in a season where I think authenticity has been so important. People are tired of a Photoshop life. Their reality shows, I think, are some of the top shows on TV. It's funny because they're reality shows that aren't real. I, I don't know how you do that. I, I, I'm not into reality shows. I watched one, it was probably a few months ago, and I'm like, that's not a reality show. Like, that's not how real life happens. <laughs> As a matter of fact, thankfully, real life isn't that exciting. <laughs> but reality, authenticity is such a high value right now. People being real. People actually, you know, not, not uh, even on social media, like, there, what's that hashtag? I think it's like something like no Photoshop or something. Uh, people want real. You, are, you're, you freely admit your flaws and mistakes. Number 10, you live to help others succeed. Now, we have students all the time, they ask like, how do, I, how do I succeed in ministry? Find someone else to serve and make them, make them great. Like, lend your strength to other people. As a matter of fact, I, pr I propose that actual success in life, in, no matter what you do, is finding somebody else, finding someone else that you can actually help succeed. Uh, a, a business. 
If you're, I was in the auto parts business. It's a pretty boring business. But our job is to help other people succeed. Our job is to help the repair shop succeed. Our job is to help the walk-in customer succeed. Like, if you find a place of humility where you think of your life as the measurement of your success is in how many other people succeed because you're alive, how many know that's a real ministry? That's a real business. Where you spend your life helping other people succeed, that is what life is about. That I lay down my life for other people, it is the, it is the ultimate act of humility, the ultimate description of humility, and it is the way forward. Uh, just a few more. You're not easily offended. Gosh, I could spend the whole message on this. I, I don't know what it is about social media. I don't know if it creates people's attitude or just reveals it, probably reveals it. But you can say anything on social media and somebody will be offended. You say God is good and they'll be like, not all the time, let me tell you about my, and I'm like, people just live offended. Sometimes, have you ever had anyone tell you a story about their hurt or their pain and it's 20 years ago and they're telling it as if it happened last week. I'm like, listen, carrying offense is a bummer. <laughs> And you may think you're hurting the person that you carry unforgiveness towards, but you're actually killing yourself. And not only that, but you're living in arrogance when you can't let somebody go. How many understand that Jesus forgave you? And that means that he gave you the position, the right, and the authority to forgive other people. I love Joyce Myers, and I love what she said. She said, unforgiveness is like drinking deadly poison and think the other person's going to die. Forgiveness. Number 12, you're thankful. You have a thankful attitude. And thankfulness will inoculate you from arrogance. There's just no way to be thankful and arrogant at the same time. Because thankfulness says, I owe gratitude for something I wasn't able to do or something that someone did for me. Number 13, you don't live with a sense of entitlement. You don't feel like anyone owes you a living. This is pretty big for us right now. Sometimes we're, we spend our lives blaming people and feeling like, well, the government should take care of me. Well, my parents should take care of me. Well, the, you know, some, there's always someone else. Like, I'm a victim and someone should take care of me. Listen, humility realizes oh, no, nobody owes me anything, including God. Number, 13, number 14, you're quick to forgive and you don't hold grudges. I think we already covered that another way. And number 15, you're confident in who you are and content in who you're not. I, I want to just finish this today by saying there's no way you won't succeed if you find humility. Humility is the way forward. I've been praying for our, our, our governors, our mayors, our city officials, our president, our world leaders to find this place of humility. And I believe it's in humility that revelation is going to come. Revelation for the restoration of bodies. Revelation for the cure for the virus. I just feel so, I'm so convinced that God's, we are in this, uh, in this moment of divine providence when the Lord is helping us through, if you will, this treacherous season. He's guiding us. He's like, just follow. Lord, I don't know what to do. Just follow. Listen, Lord, I, I don't know if that's the right way. It's the right way if you see me in front of you. Our options have been limited. The Lord has us on a timeout. We are allowing the Holy Spirit to search our own hearts. We're saying, Lord, is there anyone else that I can promote? Is there someone else I can help succeed? Is there, is there anything in me? Is there unforgiveness? Is there anything in me that needs to be fixed? Listen, I want to say again, if you spend a lot of time listening to news and media, you're going you're gonna to be... It's, you, you risk being frog-boiled in the blame and shame game of the political spirit or the religious spirit. And I want to say, that's not the way forward. The way forward is to find this place where we say, God, you're in charge of our life. I totally trust you. I want to say right now, I, I feel so strongly that the Lord's actually, he's calling some people back to him. I feel right now that there's a strong 
sense that the Lord is drawing some of you back. And some of you, you've wandered so far away, you're like, the Lord could never take me back. And I'm reminded of the prodigal son. I'm reminded of the prodigal son story when he leaves his father's house and he just does everything wrong. And yet the father is in, he is in faithful expectation, watching and waiting for his son to return. And he is, if you will, he is preparing for the re-entry of his son long before his son turns around. And I want to say the father, the heavenly father is waiting for you to return. He's waiting for you to humble yourself and say, like the prodigal son story, I messed, I messed it up. I got it wrong. I was wrong. And you know what? The Lord's not trying to, he's not trying to rub it in your face. But confession, first John, John, first John says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive our sins. And then he cleanses from all unrighteousness. And I want to tell you, if you're watching this right now, and you've walked away from the Lord, and I just feel like there's just thousands of people that will watch this over the next two months, that this, just, this part of the message, you're like, that's me. I, I've wandered away. I want to tell you, some of you have wandered into immorality. You've, you've, wandered, you've wandered into selfish ambition. You've built your own castle. And the Lord's like, listen, I want to bless you. I want to be the one who blesses you. But I don't want the gold, metaphorically, that I give you to be turned into a golden calf that you serve. I don't want my blessing to become your God. Lord, I just pray right now for so many people. And you know what? Several of you have said to God, if you get me out of this circumstance, I'll serve you. And I see there's a, there's a man, uh, there's, a, there's a man, you've told the Lord five different times. You've had two drug overdoses. And you've told the Lord five different times, if you save me out of this, I will follow you. But you haven't followed him. And the Lord's saying to you right now, he forgives you. He's graciously been waiting for you. And I want to tell you that the Lord is healing so many bodies. And some of you are sick and you're like, I don't deserve to be healed. I've done this and this. And God says, no, no, I, I died for, to forgive sin, not to forgive mistakes. And God wants you to know that none of us deserve to be healed. But right now the Lord is healing you. And by the way, if you stay sick when God is trying to heal you, you're saying to Jesus, what you did on the cross isn't good enough for me. And God's healing people from pancreatic, pancreatic cancer. He's healing someone from, brain, from a brain tumor. It's something in your right eye. Something, something's happening with people with a, a back problem. There's venereal diseases. God's healing several people with venereal disease. And right now, I just want to finish this, this broadcast by saying right now, I release healing and salvation over you in Jesus' name.